hey, White Flag, we are so excited that you have joined us today online. My name is Steve. And I'm Christy. And now is the perfect time to invite someone to join you in a White Flag experience. All you need to do is just simply hit the share button right now. And hey, if you are new with us, we are so glad that you are here watching us online. If this is your first time, again, all you need to do to connect with us is text new to WF at 97000. And just for doing that, we're going to give you a free t-shirt. That's right. Even though we aren't here together today, we still want to make sure that they get that gift. So we have been getting a ton of calls over the past 24 hours with people asking us, how are we able to connect with you this weekend? And we keep telling them the same thing over and over. Check us out online. We have got tons of options. You can go to our, our website, our app. We have Facebook. Uh, what else do we got? We got Roku, Apple TV, Vimeo. Vimeo, that's right. We have got options. all kinds of options that we want to connect with you on. And let me say this. If you are having trouble figuring out how to connect with us, or if you have a family member that needs a little assistance in doing that, make sure you call us here at the church so we can help walk you through that those steps in connecting with us. Or we'll even come over to your house and help you get set up that way. That's how serious we are about connecting. I think they might even bring a housewarming gift of toilet paper as well. Probably not. I don't think they're going to be able to find it. Maybe not. Hey, thank you so much to those of you who have already given online. If you haven't had a chance yet to give, this is the perfect opportunity for you to set up online giving. You can do that by just going to our White Flag website or on our White Flag app. That's right. Well, today we are concluding our series, Killing Ugly. Pastor Paul is going to be talking about self-control. And next weekend, we are launching a brand new series called Eyes on Jesus. And we cannot wait to connect with you. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Gardner and I'm the executive director here at White Flag. And we are really excited to launch that new series next weekend, Eyes on Jesus. But I'll tell you, we are going to be continually monitoring this ever evolving situation with the coronavirus. We will make sure to heed the warnings and the directions being provided by our, by our healthcare professionals and our government officials. And so now is a very important time to make sure that you are able to stay connected with White Flag. It's a great time to follow us on social media, to make sure that you're getting our emails, to download the White Flag app and enable the push notifications because we're gonna be sending updates out every couple of days to let you know what our plans are as we progress forward through this situation. And I want to remind everybody about the announcement we made a few days ago about our Senior Support Task Force. This is a really great opportunity that we have to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this really scary time for our senior citizens. This is a, an important time for them to heed the warnings, to stay home and protect themselves from the coronavirus. And so we will send a team of volunteers out that will actually run errands for you, go to the grocery store, do anything that will help you to be able to stay home and protect your health and well-being. So if that's you that you'd like to, to get that support, you can just call the White Flag office and we will mobilize that team of volunteers for you. And if you'd like to join that team, you can just jump on the White Flag app and let us know there and we'll let you know when we have a request come in. Well, that's all we have and I'll tell you we've got a great, uh, we've got a great message for you as Pastor Paul is going to be preaching on self-control.
everybody. Welcome to White Flag Online. Now, this is not a normal occurrence where we are literally shutting down a campus so that we can go online and communicate with our entire church in that way. But I'll tell you, you know, you just don't know what to expect these days. And that's why it's good to know that our God is never changing, always faithful, and he's got our back. And so here we are. And uh, I am with you virtually in your home, you could say, and uh, it's not the, the way I wish we could do it, but it's the way that we're going to be doing it, and we don't know for how long, and so uh, I'm, I'm sitting here on stage, and, and uh, the, the scriptures that I'm going to be bringing to you will pop up right here on the TV, and I've got my Bible, and you know, I hope that you are comfortable where you are. You know, we're, we're bringing to a close a 10-week series, and God knew that this would be the way that, that, that this topic would be talked about and so I'm trusting that God has something great to say to you uh, through this message. So we're in week 10 of our series Killing Ugly and today's topic is self-control and uh, if you've not been a part of our church and you don't know what Killing Ugly is all about this is a series about the fruit of the spirit and about the battle that goes on in our soul uh, as we give our life to Christ and yet we still live in the flesh and we still have sin and we live in a fallen world. There's a battle that goes on and uh, God wants us to draw close to him so that his fruit can be placed in our lives and developed and we become more like him and we die to the ugly. We kill the ugly. And so today we're going to talk about self-control because it's the last of what Paul uh, says about the description of the fruit of the Spirit. And remember, it is a package deal, and we're at the very end of this package deal. Now, this week, I had the unique opportunity to take care of my daughter Avery's puppy. Now, this puppy is like six or seven months old, and uh, it's huge. It's a German short-haired pointer. It is a crazy energetic dog, and it's a puppy. Like any puppy, they're going to be out of control. Self-control would not be, you know, a quality that you would, you know, give to this dog. Now, one area in particular that this dog struggles with is eating. When you put a bowl of food in front of this dog, it eats it so fast that it literally gets sick and throws up which is not good for Avery, who has to clean it up, and it's not good for the dog. And so after some research, Avery discovered that there was a way to get her dog to slow down when he eats. It's called a maze bowl, a maze bowl, like, you know, a, a maze, like uh, all the little lines, and there's only one way to get through the maze. Imagine that in like a 3D version. And so instead of a deep dish, there is a, a deep dish that has a maze in it. Well, it's hard to explain. It's probably easier for me just to show you. So let me have you look at this video here. This is Avery's dog, Chestnut. He is so cute. And you can see in his eyes, he is just ready to eat. And man, if, if, if it was just a bowl of food, it would be gone in 30 seconds. But here is a maize bowl. And you can see the dog working its way around the maze. And he has to then slowly eat instead of eating too quickly. He avoids bloating and getting sick to his stomach. And he's a happy camper. And Avery's a happy camper. And so uh, I was happy to be able to use that bowl to help him practice self-control. He's a dog. You know, he doesn't know any better. Well, here's the reality. Uh, sometimes I don't know any better either. And I'm not a dog. I'm a human. Um, this past week, we wrapped up a biggest loser competition uh, with our staff. So for the last eight weeks, uh, those on our staff that wanted to participate uh, were in a competition. We all turned in our weight uh, eight weeks ago, and we, we set a goal weight. Uh, that was in case there was a tie. But basically, we were going to go off of like percentage of weight loss. And so each week, we would check in, and we would give our weight and we, you know, we would have individual winners each week, but you know, really the ultimate goal was who was going to win the whole thing. And I really, really worked hard. Uh, in fact, I think I set like a 10-pound goal in eight weeks, and uh, I, I met that goal, but I did not win first place. I was very frustrated. I took third place. My assistant, in fact, won first place, and she doesn't uh, have any problem reminding me of that. But uh, the reason I tell you we were in this biggest loser competition is that um, I 
you know, had some self-enforced control measures, if you will, on my life for that eight weeks. And I really watched what I ate, and, and I was careful, and I was exercising, and I had a plan. Now, as soon as the competition was over, literally the day I turned in my final number, uh, can I just tell you that, like, the wheels fell off? I mean, I literally lost all control. Here's what I ate immediately following the final weigh-in. I went to lunch at Cane's, and I got the big box uh, chicken finger meal. I got extra, extra fries. I said, keep the slaw, keep the toast. I want extra, extra fries on top of the side of fries. And then I got the four chicken fingers, and I got a, you know, one of their large uh, lemonades. It was delicious. That was my lunch. Immediately when I got done at Cane's, I drove to Krispy Kreme. I ordered six glazed donuts. Now, I did exercise a little bit of self-control because they said, hey, for $2 less, or for about two bucks or less, you can get a, a full dozen. I said, no, just give me six. And so I got the six, I drove home, and in one sitting, I ate all six of the Krispy Kreme donuts, and they were delicious. They were delicious. I can taste them right now. Um, then... Uh, you know, I let a few hours pass, but it was time for dinner. I didn't eat lunch until like, I think, one or two. Then I went to Krispy Kreme. Around seven or eight, I went to dinner. I chose Taco Bell. And I got, you know, a burrito. I got two tacos. I got a, a quesadilla. And I got cinnamon twist and a soda. It was delicious. Immediately following Taco Bell, I went to the movies. When I got to the movies, I got a small popcorn which I never get a small popcorn I usually get a medium and I got a Rolos I brought some Rolos I, I snuck them in don't tell anyone and I got a soda that's how much the wheels fell off as soon as my self-imposed parameters kind of went away I, I lost all self-control um, by the way uh, I know that Chestnut has not figured this out yet, but there are some dogs figuring out this maze bowl. Uh, check out this video I saw online. This is not her dog. This is another dog. And uh, I guess he got fed up with uh, having any control measures on his eating, and he's just figured uh, a workaround, right? A workaround to get what he wants to get. And I'll tell you what, that's where dogs and humans are a lot alike. Uh, we all find workarounds in certain areas of our life. And the problem is those workarounds that keep us from actually exercising self-control can really destroy our lives. I mean, they can wreak havoc. And uh, we want to have mastery over our own lives. We want to think that we're in control. But the struggle is real. For you... I don't know what that is. It's going to be different for everybody. It might be diet. It might be lust. It might be worry. It might be technology. It might be social media. It might be procrastination. It might be anger. It might be your temper. It might be alcohol. It might be drugs. Listen, everybody's got something that they struggle to control. They're tempted by. It's a vice for them. It's a go-to. Uh, it, it's an indulgence. You see, God knows that we have these things in our lives. God knows that the struggle is real. And he wants to empower you. God wants to empower you to have lasting victory over these temptations. Now, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness and that last one self-control it's kind of interesting self-control is at the tail end of this because it does have the word self in it and i've been emphasizing through this whole series that that the fruit of the spirit is of god it's a gift from him produced in us and while that's very true as we get to the end here self-control reminds us that we do play a role in this it's not that we just sit back and do absolutely nothing 
God does it in us, but we are coming alongside of God and participating in this journey to become more in step with the Spirit, to become more like Jesus, to become more like the Father, to share His DNA. Now, we're not alone in this. God is with us, and God wants to develop this fruit in us. So, so let's talk about kind of the definition of, of self-control I assume you you know what it means but here's a definition that I like self-control physical and emotional self-mastery particularly in situations of intense provocation and temptation I mean that, that's a great definition the physical and emotional self-mastery that that needs to happen in our lives in situations of intense provocation or temptation in other words you know in the really difficult times when you really want to do that thing that you know that you shouldn't do that's requiring something out of you self-control now what's interesting is in scripture how often self-control is talked about it's talked about in all different you know walks of life for all different age groups all different stages of life shoot just paul alone uh says to men he says specifically to men Men, you need to urge younger men to be self-controlled. Like it's a training thing that men, we should know that self-control is going to be hard. So we should urge younger men to really focus on learning how to have that self-discipline. Paul also says, women, you should adorn yourself with self-control. Not with fancy outfits or expensive clothing or gold earrings, but you should adorn yourself with self-control. Uh, so it's, it's for men, it's for women. And Paul also says, look, if you want to be an overseer or a leader, an elder in the church, man, you've got to demonstrate self-control. If you want to have authority, you've got to have self-control. If you don't have that, you can't be a leader. So, you know, basically all different walks of life, it doesn't matter what your age is, God's word is emphasizing this needs to be a fruit that's in our lives. Now, God's word lays out the clear command to be self-controlled and, and it's also filled with examples, specific examples, good and bad, of people who either exercised self-control or they didn't and what the results of that were. So let, let me talk to you about two of those examples. I want to talk to you about Jesus, who is our ultimate example, and David. And some of these stories, uh, maybe you have heard of, I'm sure you have. These are the more familiar, more familiar details from both of these uh, individuals' lives. And so let's first talk about the good example in Jesus. You'll remember that when Jesus went into his public ministry, right before he started his public ministry, he went to the wilderness or the desert and he fasted and prayed for 40 days. Why did he do that? Well, I can tell you why I think he did it. Uh, he knew that he was about to go into public ministry where he would be tempted just like you and I are tempted. Remember, Scripture tells us that. And it's hard to understand that, that Jesus, the Son of God, you know, set aside his authority and his power to live as a human, but he did. And so he knows he's about to go into the public eye doing ministry where he will be tempted, where he will be attacked, where there will be some shortcuts that could be made. And what does he do? He retreats. 40 days he fasts. 40 days he fasts and he prays. It's as if Jesus knew that in order to stand up to the temptation that was about to come, he needed to power up with the Father. And so he leaned into the Father. Now, as Jesus was doing that, uh, of course it says in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 4, that, that the devil came to tempt Jesus. The devil wanted to take him off his path, just like he wants to take you off your path. The devil comes in, and as he begins to communicate and tempt Jesus, Jesus does something very important. He holds on to God's truth rather than the tease. He holds on to the truth rather than the tease. What was the tease? Well, you know, Satan comes to Jesus and, you know, there's like 
three little scenes to this story. Uh, first of all, uh, Satan says, look, if you're the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Now, you know, Jesus, of course, has been fasting, so that, that's a great temptation to come at him with. Um, but Jesus uh, does not uh, bite. He doesn't look at the T's. He holds on to the truth. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's the truth. He holds on to the truth. Well, then the devil says, all right, uh, let's go to the holy city. Let's go to the top of the temple. And, and why, don't we, why don't we have you throw yourself off? If you're the son of God, you could throw yourself off this building. And God's going to send all of his angels to, to save you and protect you and rescue you. you, you you're not going to be hurt at all. Let, let's do that. And Jesus says, no, we're, we're not going to be tempted to, to, to be insecure here and, and try to substantiate who I am. I'm going to trust the word of God. And so Jesus responds back. It is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so the devil moves to stage three, takes him to a mountaintop and says, look, all these kingdoms are yours. You can have everything right now. All you got to do is bow to me. Jesus doesn't focus on the T's. He decides to focus on the truth, and he says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, what, what, what do we gain by uh, looking at this story? Well, it's a great example. Yes, Jesus is the son of God, and we could chalk it up to he always knows what to do, but remember, he's in human form, and what does he do? He prepares himself before he's in temptation— while he's in temptation, he focuses on God's truth. He keeps talking about the Father and the Father's word. His focus is there, not on what might come from fulfilling these temptations. And that is key to understanding what you should do when you're struggling with self-control. It's a great example. And I'll tell you, the devil, it says, after that third attempt, it says the devil left him. Now, I'm not trying to say this is, uh, you know, the, thus saith the Lord, but my interpretation of that would be resist faithfully, resist long enough, resist consistently, and guess what? The devil is going to take off and look for someone else to prey on. And that's what we're looking to have happen in our lives. We're looking to draw into the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee. Well, you know, I say that. The Lord doesn't say that. He does say that in another passage. So that, that one you can kind of take to the bank. Now, uh, David. Here's a bad example. I'll use a very familiar bad segment of David's life. David, you know, his upside was the days he's, you know, killing giants. The down days are when he looks too long at women who don't belong to him, right? And so let's talk about David and Bathsheba. David, unlike Jesus, put himself in a very, very bad situation. What was that situation? Well, he was on a roof when he was supposed to be at war. If you do the, the study in, in Samuel on this, you'll see that it says, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, it was springtime, the time when kings were at war. I think that's the opening line. Why is that important? Well, well David is not with his fighting men. He's not with his armor, army. He's at home. And he's walking around, bored, you know, idle. And he goes up on the roof, and then he's, he spots a woman taking a bath. So he's not where he's supposed to be. When he's there, he then sees Bathsheba taking a bath. And what does he do? He lingers instead of leaving. He lingers instead of leaving. So he looks and he studies her and he's attracted to her and he's filled with lust. His next move is to, to get one of his attendants to go find out who she is. He wants, he wants some you know, details about her life and every, everything he can know about her because he's lingering on this thought. He, he then eventually has her brought to the castle brought to his house and when she comes to the house well he allows his lust to spill over and he seduces her and sleeps with her 
not only does he sleep with her, exercising no self-control, there are some consequences that come into that, and she becomes pregnant. Now, instead of confessing, David decides to cover it up. He covers things up instead of confessing, and so things just exponentially go out of control because he exercised no self-control. He ends up trying to lure back her husband so that he could get them to sleep together so that there aren't any, you know, alarm bells that go off when he gets back from war and she's pregnant when he knows he's not been with her for a long period of time. But, but he doesn't fall for that or he doesn't do that to honor his other warriors uh, who are out in, the, uh, out in the field in the battle. And so that complicates things and actually pushes David to the point where his only solution that he can come up with because he has no control is to murder Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. And so that's exactly what he does. And it causes all kinds of ripple effects, negative ripple effects in David's life. Now, there's a good example and there's a bad example. One exercising self-control, one not. Now listen, these two examples offer us predictable patterns that you'll see play out in your life and I'll see play out in my life. These are ways to find victory and ways to give in and to fail miserably when it comes to temptation. God not only wants to develop his fruit of self-control in you, as, as we read in Galatians 5, he wants the fruit of the Spirit to be developed in you, but he wants to equip you by giving you these examples in his word So you don't have to learn the hard way. So that you can be inspired and encouraged by the good examples and be warned by the bad examples. Why? Because God loves you. He desperately loves you. He's gone to great measures to take care of all of your problems and to take care of all of your needs by sending his son Jesus. He loves you and God hates sin and he hates sin the consequences of sin. I know some of you think God hates you. God doesn't hate you. God loves you. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. God hates sin. And this is why I think self-control is talked about so often and repeatedly in scripture from so many different angles because God wants us all to develop self-control not because like he's this demanding God that wants us to follow all these rules just because he wants us to follow some rules. He knows that self-control will self-govern us and protect us He also knows that we're never going to be able to pull that off alone and consistently. And so his spirit comes alongside of us, dwells in us, and guides us and leads us. Again, he's trying to cover every base to protect his children. And so God's word has more truth than I have time to talk about today about self-control. So we've looked at some examples. Uh, Now I want to, to help you with your mindset as you face your battles. Because, again, I don't know what your battles are, but I know for sure that right now, some of you are literally hanging by a thread with your battle against alcoholism or with uh, internet, you know, uh, pornography on the internet or with, you know, procrastination and it's cost you job after job after job and you can be good at it for a while uh, and, 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 and practice self-control, but then all of a sudden the wheels fall off and then you make a big mess. Listen, I know that we're all going through it and it's not a cute little story. It is devastating in our lives and the devil uses it on so many different levels to, to discourage us. And so what I wanna do next is, is help you with your mindset, right? Let's say you get the importance of practicing self-control you understand that god is going to develop this fruit in you but like what could i tell you to help you with today's battle and tomorrow's battle specifically for you well it's a mindset game right you got to train your mind to focus on some truth so i've got three mindsets for the battle of self-control in your life how did i come up with these well these are just things that that I have to remind myself and uh, you and I are are pretty much the same 
right? You know, you might think, oh, you're a pastor and you don't struggle with stuff. I struggle with just as much stuff as you do. So these have helped me in the past, uh, and so hopefully they'll help you. So here's number one, the first mindset for your battle with self-control. Identify cracks and consequences. If you're taking notes at home, just write that down. Identify cracks and consequences. Well, what in the world are the cracks and what are the consequences? Well, let me read to you a passage that might help you understand my point. Proverbs 25, verse 28. It says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Now, that verse is very clear. I, I've taught on this verse many times. I've, I've uh, you know, shared it in many different contexts, but it kind of speaks for itself. All you got to know is a little bit about history in terms of cities, war, and before all the technology that we had today, what the first line of defense was. Well, guess what it was? It was a wall. It was just simply a stone wall, a built wall that would protect a city. And a city could thrive if it had that protection. And, and, and this uh, proverb is, is building off that. Like a city whose walls are broken through, broken down. Let's say uh, you envision this wall around a city. If there was a crack, if there was a gap, if there was a hole in a wall, man, a city back in the first century w- would know very clearly and very simply, they would understand, hey, this isn't good. Our enemies can make their way right in. If they can make their way through this crack, through this gaping hole, well, that means their swords are coming in. You know, it means the army's coming in. It means our children, our women are going to be in jeopardy. Our lives are at stake. And what would they do? They would examine the wall. They would repair the wall. And they would feel safe because they had that first line of defense up. Well, listen, if you don't understand that in your life, you have to have a line of defense, a wall of protection around you, especially in the areas of temptation, you're kidding yourself. You've got to have this mindset. I mean, if you struggle with alcohol, for example, um, you've got to have a wall. Your wall might include, look, I'm not going to go to a bar or I'm not going to go to a restaurant where they serve alcohol or I'm not going to be around these old friends who constantly drink because these are things that will weaken my defense. If you don't have that mindset, identifying cracks in your life and the consequences that come from not examining where the cracks are, see, that's the key, man. You've got to understand, like, you know, if it's a city wall, you know they're coming in, they're going to kill you. It's pretty simple. Get out there and fix it up. But a lot of us play a game where we don't realize Oh, the crack is there, and this, this thought or this image or this experience might creep into my life, but, you know, it's no big deal. Listen, it is a big deal. You need to play out the consequences. If I go back into drinking, if I go back into, you know, uh, looking at internet pornography, if I go back into that space in my life, what will happen? Will, will I lose my family? Will I lose my marriage? Will I be arrested? You know, whatever it is that you're struggling with, you got to think through those consequences. you got to examine the cracks in your soul, in your life. So that's the first mindset. The second mindset, be fearless and confident. Be fearless and confident. What does that one mean? Well, Let's go to this passage. I love this passage. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and it says this. For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid. I'll just hold on that right there. You can see it's highlighted in yellow. It does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-control. There's that self-control. It comes from the Lord and, and we already know that all of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit comes from the Lord. But what I want you to understand is, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid is critical in your understanding, in your mindset as you try to face your temptations. You see, I think sometimes we have the mindset uh, that, you know, I'm weak and I'm just human and I'm going to, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we're just human and we're going to make mistakes and that's what the you know uh, whole grace thing is for and we kind of put ourselves in this 
defeated, lack of confidence, you know, role when we should understand that if we're children of God, that we have been given, we have been given a spirit and that spirit makes us courageous. It makes us confident. It makes us fearless because we're not in it alone. Whatever we are tackling in our lives, even a temptation, even the practice of self-discipline or self-control, we're doing with the power of God, which, by the way, is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what's at work in your life. That's what's at work in my life. And so, you know, if you're open in the refrigerator and you're lingering too long and you're standing there and you're going, man, I want to eat everything in sight, you know, uh, do you realize? And yes, even in the areas of diet, right? I think in all areas where we're trying to honor God with, with self-control, we aren't doing it alone and we have a supernatural power that we don't even tap into sometimes, Remember, you don't just pull that out of the air. That supernatural power is at work in your life because all along the way, you've been doing time with the Spirit in God's Word, through prayer, talking to Jesus, talking to God. It is a, we're, we're staying connected to the vine, and that power is on tap in our lives. And so, maybe you're just not aware that you should have kind of a, and this doesn't mean a cocky, confidence or an arrogance where you have no fear it just means that you know that whatever you face in this world temptation wise self-control wise you're not facing it alone and we don't have to be timid as that verse had said now the third and the final one that i want to share with you a third mindset for the battle of self-control is to resist not resisting Resist not resisting. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, this one you can probably draw a conclusion on. Resist not resisting. Well, let me read to you a pretty long passage. I mean, it's four or five verses here. Uh, we'll break it down in a couple of s- two sections. But it's in 2 Peter chapter 1, and I just love this passage, verses 5 through 9. So, so let's begin in verse 5. Here's what it, what it says. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith now let me emphasize make every effort for this very reason make every effort what does that mean that means not kind of not sort of not you know when you feel like it but it means work fight claw do whatever you have to do to make this effort to do what to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love now that was a lot of things here but you'll notice self-control is right there you also notice a lot of the fruit is is right there goodness right godliness love so so in this beginning section of of chapter one five six and seven it says make every effort to be adding this to your life right developing this fruit along with god but then it goes on to say for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure and again i've emphasized increasing measure right so you are to make every effort to add this fruit into your life and it is supposed to be a quality that's increasing in measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus christ but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins that's a little reminder that says wait a minute you used to be lost and dead and enslaved to sin you then gave your life to jesus and he radically transformed you changed you from dead to to being alive from an old creation to a new creation 
He then gives the deposit of his spirit living inside you to set you free from the bondage of sin. You're covered by grace. All that happens, and, and you're not going to continue to lean into that relationship. You'd have to be nuts not to do that. And so don't forget how far you've come, but keep increasing this in your life. So you've got to resist not resisting, right? So you can't just ever kind of go through life going, well, I'll try self-control in, in certain areas and in some areas I won't. I'll try to govern myself in, in this area, but not that area. Look, you need to be a person who is in line with God's word in every area, knowing that you're not capable of being perfect, but knowing that you should be making every effort possible. So never just get comfortable with this. In our white flag strong acrostic, this is why T in the word strong stands for tackle sin. It means you need to aggressively and purposely do this. So those are three mindsets for you to have uh, if you want to uh, find victory in your battle for self-control. Now, here's what I'm going to close by sharing with you. This is something that I take very serious. So serious, in fact, uh, that, that I'm about to do something I've never done uh, in 25 years of being a pastor. So I'm getting ready to take a sabbatical. Now, a sabbatical is going to be, uh, or it is, a extended time off, you know, from ministry where you completely disconnect. It's not like a couple of weeks of vacation. It is a purposeful break of rest and, and, and restoring and, um, you know, refueling and, and allowing God to prepare me so that I can be strong for my next 25 years of ministry. And so I shared with my staff this week, um, here's the short version of what I shared with them. I said, here's the deal. In June, I won't be here. In July, I won't be here. And in August, I won't be here. I'm going to be gone June, July, and August, three months. Now, originally, I was going to take a six-month sabbatical, which is pretty standard uh, for pastors at this point in their career. But... Um, you know, we're in, the middle of, we're in the middle of a building campaign. The building is, we're, we're going to be launching the, the groundbreaking in just a few, you know, months. And so how do I do this? Well, you know, we're working through all that and we've got it all timed out. And these are the months that will work really well. Well, I, I wanted to make sure that my team understood that, you know, I'm not just going somewhere, you know, to be going somewhere. I, I'm purposely taking a step back for a reason. And you know what the reason is? Really, it's so that I can be a pastor who demonstrates self-control. You know, I, I'm luckily, I should say, I'm blessed and thankful that, you know, I have a wife that loves me. Uh, I have kids that love the Lord, uh, that, that I uh, have no... Uh, you know, addictions that are controlling my life. I, I have never been accused of uh, stealing money from the, the church, uh, you know, safe or bank account. Um, and I've worked hard for that integrity for 25 years. But in order for me to maintain that, I got to make sure that I have balance in my life. And so this break is going to serve as an opportunity for me to maintain self-control. So rather than going into a forced sabbatical because I just wrecked my marriage or I just got accused of something, I want to live my life where that never happens. Well, in order to do that, I've got to lean into God at certain periods of time in a more greater way. And man, I'll tell you what, um, I need it. I need it bad. I, I want to be at my best when I come back, as we launch into the most exciting time in our church's history, and so I can't think of any better way than to, like Jesus did, carve out a special time to really be filled with the Spirit, be filled with rest, and be filled with focus so that I can maintain my wall and be the leader that you want me to be. And so uh, I'll tell you more about that in the future, but the reason I share that now is because it's all about self-control you might not be in a position where you need to or you even can take a sabbatical from life right now. But I'm telling you, if you're not paying attention to the, to the pulse, to the heartbeat that you have, 
with temptation, with your relationship with God, with sin, with all in between, you are vulnerable. And so you need to take steps, practical steps, to help yourself develop self-control. And remember, you're not developing it alone. God is right there with you, helping you kill the ugly. And so that's all I got for you today. And uh, I, I wish I could, you know, have a song sung and uh, invite you to come forward, make a decision. But you know what? You can make any decision you want to make right where you're sitting. If you've been listening to this series about killing ugly and you know it's time for you to make a decision to give your life to the Lord, make it right now. If you're ready to be baptized, you know, shoot us an email, shoot us a text, call us. Uh, or if you're somewhere where you got someone who's also a Christian, have them baptize you right where you are. Listen, there's all kinds of ways around this uh, connection that we might be having for the next few weeks via camera. Uh, this can happen right where you are right now. But you may need to make these important decisions and you shouldn't wait until this coronavirus thing passes. You need to make whatever decisions you need to make right now, whatever commitments you need to make right now. 10 weeks, we've talked about killing the ugly. I hope that you've been on that journey and uh, I hope that you continue along with Jesus. So thanks for listening. God bless you. I'm gonna pray us out of here and then we'll see you next time. God, thank you so much for this time that we've had together. Thank you so much for technology. Father, thank you for the science and the medicine that we have in our country. And we just lift up our leaders. We lift up our community leaders, our national leaders, and we just pray for protection over our country. Along with that, Father, we pray for the fruit of the Spirit to be developed in each and every one of us by your power. We love you so much for loving us and giving us your Spirit. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Jail cell, cell, cell. They try to break me down. But